On this episode, we visit the San Francisco Department of Public Health and their program for elderly pedestrians. Then we take BART to the Congress for the New Urbanism. We look at signs and signals in Winston-Salem that ignore pedestrians. We head to St. Louis to find out about state and local pedestrian programs. Finally, we drop in on Railvolution, the National Conference on Building Livable Communities with Transit. Stay tuned. We're talking with Michael Radetzky, who's CHIPS coordinator for the Department of Health, the City of San Francisco. What is CHIPS? Uh, CHIPS is the Community and Home Injury Prevention Program for Seniors. So it's a program of the San Francisco Health Department looking to reduce injuries to seniors in San Francisco. And what sort of injuries would it be that you're looking at? Well, the biggest problem for seniors is falls. So a, a very large component of the program is looking at falls in the home and in the community, scalds, burns, uh, mo uh, motor vehicle involved injuries, uh, really the whole range of injuries. Uh, and that's, I guess that's what got me into my, my interest in pedestrian uh, problems, uh, is that uh, while falls is far and away the, the biggest uh, cause of injury, uh, probably the, the number two is uh, uh, motor vehicle pedestrian uh, uh, crashes. Uh, that is where, where pedestrians are hit by motor vehicles. I, I'm trying to avoid the word accident. Uh, we see that as a, a real uh, confusion uh, because accidents suggest that things just happen and uh, crashes and other injuries are preventable and we want to see them as things that have causes and can be prevented. So we try not to talk about accidents. But uh, pedestrian uh, injuries uh, are a very serious problem for seniors uh, and, of course, uh, they're a serious problem for the rest of the population as well. Uh, but that's what got me into this to begin with. So you've moved beyond ships to a separate group to look at pedestrian injuries then. What are you calling it? Well, there's a San Francisco Pedestrian Safety Task Force uh, that's uh, se separate from CHIPS. I mean, I'm, I still coordinate the CHIPS program. Uh, but uh, the Pedestrian Safety Task Force... Uh, which is staffed by the Senior Action Network, uh, but looks at pedestrian safety for all ages and has representatives from the police department, uh, the Department of Parking and Traffic, the Department of City Planning, uh, the City Attorney's Office, as well as the Health Department and other community groups. What common elements do you see across age groups and what differences do you see across age groups with pedestrian crashes? Well, uh, the, the common element is that uh, there's very little regard for pedestrian right-of-way uh, and that our, our streets are not pedestrian-friendly. Uh, until very recently, uh, pedestrians were mostly considered a nuisance uh, for the primary uh, uh, mode of transportation, uh, which uh, is considered to be automobiles. And um, the, the best thing I think that the San Francisco uh, Pedestrian Safety Task Force has accomplished locally so far, we've made a few very, very small localized changes. But the, the best thing I think we've accomplished is to, to really get uh, the traffic engineers uh, to begin to see pedestrians as a legitimate part of the transportation picture. Uh, so that, that's, I think, uh, the, the striking commonality across all age groups uh, is the, the need to see pedestrians as part of the transportation picture and to make the streets environmentally safe for pedestrians. Beyond that, though, there are some real differences. Uh, for small children, the principal uh, pedestrian uh, uh, problem or the, the, the main source, source of uh, uh, injury is suddenly running out into the street. Uh, and that uh, we need uh, parent supervision uh, and and uh, school site uh, uh, interventions uh, as well as educational uh, interventions. Um, but um, seniors very rarely run out into the street chasing a ball. 
most of our seniors uh, are injured uh, in the crosswalk between the white lines with the right of way with the green light uh, unfortunately they feel that because they're following the rules because they're doing the right thing uh, they're safe uh, and so I, I talk to groups of seniors about uh, the dangers of being dead right which is just as dead as dead wrong uh, and I don't, I don't want to be blaming the victim here. Uh, I think that we, we need to reconfigure our streets, the timing on our lights, which is very important for seniors uh, and other people with mobility problems. Uh, but uh, I do think that in the meantime, uh, it's important for seniors to, to also uh, work at making themselves safer. Uh, by uh, not uh, assuming that white lines or red lights are going to stop oncoming vehicles. So, um, uh, and then for the for the adult pedestrians, uh, the the biggest problem, unfortunately, is alcohol. Uh, both the the drivers and the pedestrians. Uh, we, uh, I, we've started doing programs uh, where we've gone beyond the don't drink and drive to the don't drink and walk. So that's that's I think I think there are really three groups of pedestrians uh, that need to be uh, uh, considered somewhat separately in designing programs. Although the engineering interventions and the time interventions and the environmental interventions, uh, traffic calming, uh, slowing slowing the vehicles down, uh, is going to help all three groups. Um, there's there's some very good evidence that uh, speed of the vehicle is one of the principal uh, determinants of how seriously injured the pedestrian is going to be. Although, in San Francisco, uh, the biggest single uh, situation in which pedestrians are injured uh, is at uh, right turn on red, uh, where the pedestrian uh, is in front of a vehicle which is turning uh, semi-legally, I say semi-legally because you're allowed to turn on the red light, but you're not allowed to turn if someone is uh, crossing the street utilizing the crosswalk. And there's very little regard among drivers, uh, there's very little enforcement of pedestrian right-of-way. Uh, so, and there it's, the speed is not the factor. Uh, it's, it's just the fact that the, the driver uh, is mostly looking uh, uh, in the other direction to see if uh, there's room for them to get into the traffic flow uh, and then starting to drive, uh, make their turn uh, before even turning to see if anybody's in front of their car. So what is your task force going to be trying to accomplish over the next few years? Well, long range, our goal is to make San Francisco a pedestrian safe city. Uh, which is going to involve some very major environmental changes uh, so that uh, the lighting, uh, the distance that pedestrians need to, to go to get from one safe place to another, whether it involves bulbing of sidewalks or uh, widening of uh, median strips to provide a, a safe haven, uh, and ultimately educating um, uh, the the drivers and the enforcement of uh, driver behavior that that's the police department uh, that a pedestrian right of way is uh, uh, not only the law uh, but uh, something that needs to be maintained through through active effort um, in in the shorter run since those are those are long term and uh, rather expensive uh, uh, developments we've been looking at some of the the most uh, dangerous intersections in San Francisco and have been very successful in getting additional time in getting prohibitions of right turns on red at those intersections uh, which have been particularly dangerous or which are utilized by large numbers of seniors We're in San Francisco talking with Shelley Potisha, who's executive director of the Congress for the New Urbanism. What is the Congress? Well, the Congress is a membership organization basically advocating better urban planning to really promote cities that are livable, environmentally friendly, and sort of conservative in terms of land consumption. What sort of people become members of the Congress? Well, the Congress started with a small collection of architects and urban planners. 
And over the last six years, it's grown to this very diverse group of uh, real estate economists, developers, landscape architects, urban planners, people who work for city agencies, neighborhood activists, a very, very diverse group of people, all the folks who are sort of interested in how cities develop. And you had the annual Congress meeting uh, for five years now. Mm -hmm. What happens when you bring this diverse group of people together? Well, when we started our first Congress, it was a pretty small group, about 100 people, and they spent three days just showing each other their work and talking about what they were doing. It was really a way to kind of network folks who were all over the country doing different things. Now we have about four to 500 people come together each year, and we talk about a specific topic about what are the issues facing cities today, how do we solve those problems, and how do we really work together to make that change happen. Now, what does new urbanism have to do with walkable communities? Well, new urbanism and walkable communities are almost synonymous because really our feeling is that every city and region should be made up of walkable neighborhoods, a whole network of neighborhoods that have services within walking distance, streets that are pedestrian friendly, and really a sort of attention to design that really makes people feel comfortable walking in their communities. So that's really at the heart of what new urbanism is about. If someone wanted to find out a little more about the Congress for the New Urbanism, do you have a website? Yep, we have a website, and it's www.cnu.org. So come check us out. Pedestrian signals and street signs. Without them, pedestrians are lost, literally. We were down in Winston-Salem, North Carolina recently, where the downtown area is mostly one-way streets. The traffic engineers figured cars are only coming from one direction, so the signs only need to face one direction. The problem is, pedestrians are coming from both directions. If you are a tourist at the visitor center at 6th and Cherry and want to cross over to the convention center, you have a problem. First, you can't even tell where you are without crossing the street. Second, you can't see the lights to know when it is safe to cross. Obviously, Winston-Salem does not think much about pedestrians. We're talking with Dennis Scott, who's the Missouri State Department of Transportation and Pedestrian Bicycle Program Coordinator. What have you been up to lately? Well, we've had a bicycle pedestrian program for about four years, and it's been very slow going getting all the pieces together. One of the big pieces was the development of a statewide transportation plan. In that transportation plan, we have for the first time ever a comprehensive statewide look at bicycle and pedestrian needs in this state. One of the things called for in that was the development of a new standards and policies for our department, the Department of Transportation for Missouri, and secondly, the development of a statewide committee to deal with the very issues that relate to bicycling and walking. Now that committee has been approved, we're ready to go, we've got applications in, and those members should be appointed in about a month, which should be this winter. Um, then they will be advising all state agencies and cities and counties and other organizations on bike and pedestrian issues. The development of our policies and standards, we had a team develop a draft and that's in an approval process now. And what sort of issues will the committee be looking at? Well, the purview of the committee is very broad. Yes, they will look at what many people think of when they think of bicycle and pedestrian issues, the engineering side, sidewalks, bike lanes. Yes, but beyond that, they'll be looking at enforcement, education, encouragement. How do we encourage people to walk and bicycle? What do we do in regard to law enforcement to make it easier and safer to walk and bicycle? from the motorist side, from the bicycles and pedestrian side. Um, this whole broad range, and beyond that, we need to look at integration and implementation of this planning effort and advisory effort. In other words, how do we build into every professional, an educator or a law enforcement person or a traffic engineer, we have to build into their job thinking about bicycling and walking. It's quite a task. Do you expect things to look a little bit different 10 years or 20 years from now than they do at the moment? 
I think it's clear there's a growing demand from our communities in the state. It's just beginning to really surface, I think, in the eyes of the transportation professionals and the eyes of the elected officials. But I think we're just now beginning to find the wave that we're going to be riding to a, a, a vast change in the pedestrian and bicycle environment in our state. We're talking with Ivan Miller, who's the coordinator of the uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for the East-West Gateway Coordinating Council. That's quite a mouthful. It is. Just what is it that you do? Uh, we are a regional planning organization with transportation planning and also a metropolitan planning organization. And my committee specifically focuses on bicycle and pedestrian transportation and how that will fit in with the other different modes and to try and not only accommodate that but promote it. And what have you been up to the last couple of years? Well, the major focus recently has been to work with the different funding categories in ICT, uh, the enhancements, and then also the STP road and bridge funding. Uh, we've been successful in changing the, some of the categories, uh, some of the criteria that we use. For example, there are 10 eligible c categories under enhancements, but 93% of the funding that we spent in the St. Louis metropolitan area went to bicycle and pedestrian projects. And we imagine this year it'll be a higher percentage, maybe 99%. Because uh, we're looking at them uh, with transportation elements. Uh, what safety impacts will you get from the project? What access for low income and the elderly and the disabled? Things like that, which really has shifted, um, shifted our focus. And then with the surface transportation funding, um, we went from a few years ago only having 2% of the projects that had bicycle and pedestrian elements in this past year, it was up to 55% of the projects. And so out of $12 million, over half of them had bike and pedestrian elements in them, which is a lot more even than enhancement funding. So we're looking creatively as well as using CMAC for bicycle plans uh, around the region. It's been our major focus uh, impacting upon those funding categories. So for the average pedestrian or bicyclist in the area, what does he see now that benefits him that he didn't have before? Well, unfortunately, not very much. Uh, while we have approved all the right projects for funding, Missouri ranks very low in the U.S. for actually getting the projects built. Uh, and I think a number of those projects are in jeopardy, or the sponsors are in jeopardy, of losing some of the funding um, if they don't get the projects built. But I think with the new push to get the projects built, which is another thing we're working on, hopefully those projects will happen. We have seen some pedestrian projects, sidewalks, and uh, a little bit in the way of traffic calming. Um, some bike lanes have been striped on streets on Wide Down Boulevard, heading out to Clayton. Um, some improvements to the Forest Park bicycle path. But re we're really pushing the on-road projects here and have made that part of our criteria by which we look at the different categories. So hopefully we'll continue funding even better projects uh, from a bike and pedestrian uh, viewpoint um, and we'll get them built. So, is that the big thing we're going to hope to see in the next five or ten years is to actually see the asphalt and the concrete? I hope so. I hope we also see a lot, of, a, a lot more bike planning. Uh, we haven't had that. We'd like to put on a workshop and, and get municipal staff there, train them on these issues. We've got Dan Burden from Walkable Communities coming in. We brought him in today here for Rail Evolution. We'll get him back for a full workshop in May. We're in St. Louis talking with G.B. Arrington, who's head of the program committee for Rail Evolution. What is Rail Evolution? Revolution is a national conference built around three ideas, integrating transportation and land use, solving problems at a regional scale, and giving citizens the skills to make a difference and make all that happen. This is your third annual conference. What was the theme this year? Well, the theme this year were, were the three that we talked about, and really trying to figure out how to apply that in the St. Louis area and build the national coalition broader. So we had people from 171 different cities uh, coming to Rail Evolution this year. And what sort of people are they? They're, they're citizens, they're people from transit authorities, people from state government, universities, consultants. Uh, that's part of the excitement of Rail Evolution is it's a broad mix of people. 
And what happens when you bring this diverse group of people together? It creates electricity. It, it changes communities. People go home from the conference. What do they do then? Well, hopefully by the time they get home, their feet are back on the ground because they're very excited about it. And then they start to affect change about building livable communities at the local level. Now you picked St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis actually has a pretty good success story here. Yeah, they have, they have, they have a wonderful rail system. Uh, they've tied together all the activities in the community. And they wanted Railvolution to come here to help them take the next step of creating new development around their stations. We're talking with Jenna whitehill Beziuk, who's chair of the Marketing and Public Relations Committee of Railvolution. Railvolution sounds like a very radical idea. <laughs> is it? Not really. What it is is a return to support uh, the kinds of communities that we had in the past, town centers where you had an opportunity where you could walk to a store, where your kids could walk safely to a school, where you could go and get um, a loaf of bread or you know a cup of coffee or get uh, your cleaning or your shoes or your, your groceries without necessarily having to get into a car. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to avoid a car, but what you want is a community, a community that um, you can have the services and you can have the recreational facilities and you can have the schools close by and your employment centers close by. And you say we're going back to something that we somehow lost this? Yeah, we did lose it. Um, there was a time when that's what our, our whole nation was, was built on. It was towns, small towns, where we knew our neighbors and uh, we lived in small areas. Now, you know, the car from the 50s moved us further away from those town centers. And now what we're trying to do is sort of usurp, you know, that same kind of environment that we had from many, many years ago. And, and the kind of environment in terms of neighbor to neighbor and community to community and, and what comes with that. So revolution is looking at more than just putting in a trolley line somewhere. Yes, it's looking at trying to rebuild communities and, and the tagline that we've had for our conference is building successful communities with transit or building livable communities with transit. And um, what it really means is what's it going to take for us to sort of remember what it was like years ago um, where you had a town center and you had um, in other countries, they might be called zocalos or town centers, where you where you had community gatherings and those kinds of things, where you talked to your neighbors and you knew your neighbors, and it wasn't just a matter of, gee, this is where I live and this is where I work, but this is the community that I recreate in, this is the community that my children have relationships with other children, I don't have to necessarily drive them to every function, that they have choices, that they have choices that they can walk, that they can bike, that they can take transit, that they can take light rail, that they can um, get from from here to there and not necessarily have to get into a vehicle to do that. You've got a variety of different people mm -hmm. here at the conference. Uh, what role do the different players play in, in creating this vision? Clearly you have your citizens and Revolution started as a grassroots organization um, from citizens wanting to recreate their communities. But from that point it also is developers, it's finance people, it's um, the uh, community development folks, it's the uh, the governments, the metropolitan planning organizations, the cities, I mean it's everybody coming together, it's conservatives and it's liberals, it's everyone you know throwing away all of the titles that we have and sitting down and saying we all want the same thing, we want successful communities, let's figure out how we're going to do it. We're in St. Louis talking with Thomas Shroud, who's Executive Director of Citizens for Modern Transit. How long has your organization been around? Well, we were formed in 1985, although we trace our roots a few years prior to that. 1985 was our year of incorporation. And just what is it that you do? Well, we advocate for the establishment of Metrolink and the light rail system here in St. Louis, and uh, we also have been working for the expansion and then also the patronization of the system. Looks like you got it built. I guess you've been successful. <laughs> well, we feel like we have. We've, uh, we have 43,000 passengers a day using Metrolink. We've got uh, groundbreaking scheduled for the first expansion over to uh, uh, Belleville Area College in uh, Illinois. That will begin uh, next fall. Then we have uh, funding in place for an extension to the mid part of St. Louis County. We also have a tax initiative on the ballot uh, for next Tuesday. 
So fingers crossed on that one, yeah, I'll bet. Absolutely. So we hope to, if that passes, that'll put uh, really two or three more lines in the picture if we're on down the road. What was the key to, to your success? How did you get this built? Well, it was really a uh, grassroots effort to get uh, broad-based public support for to reintroduce rail transit into the St. Louis market. Uh, we had had a quite extensive trolley system, and, and we systematically dismantled it in St. Louis. But uh, a lot of people began to feel that, uh, that light rail, with its many benefits and the use of existing right-of-way, that we could begin to make some important land use decisions in St. Louis to help revitalize the cores of the city of St. Louis, which has been under a lot of stress over the years and also to uh, broaden the market for the appeal of light rail transit that the bus system simply does not have. And uh, that's all proved to be correct. We've got uh, middle class people, uh, transit riders of choice now using the transit system. We've got people who formerly did not use the bus system now willing to take it uh, for 10 minutes, let's say, to connect into Metrolink to continue on their way. So, so it's really uh, helped broaden the appeal for public transportation in the St. Louis region and therefore uh, lends lots of options to our city as we think of the future. Some towns are just getting started on the, the quest for, for light rail. What advice would you give to a, a new group forming? Well, any new group, as you think about rail transit, uh, there's lots of images uh, that are slowly going away around the country that rail transit is something that's dirty or filthy, doesn't operate on time. Uh, the new systems that gone in the, around the country have all proven that not to be the case, but nevertheless, that in many quarters is the image, and it's important that, uh, that people be very persistent with their public officials about the fact that this is something that's important as we shape our communities for the future, and that they uh, show up at public meetings, that they uh, understand that this is a long process, you don't uh, go out and have a meeting next week and break ground two weeks after that for a light rail system. This is a long process that involves putting together money, pu putting together a plan, uh, building political support, uh, and moving the elected leadership forward. So it's a, it's a long quest. It's an important quest for cities. Don't give up. Visit us on the Internet at www.pedestrians.org.